In a previous video, I defined a compound as two or more atoms that are combined in a fixed ratio. An ionic compound, which is very similar, is two or more ions that have been combined in a fixed ratio. So the only difference between a, an, a compound and an ionic compound is that a compound it has atoms combined in a fixed ratio, and an ionic compound has ions that are combined in a fixed ratio. In an ionic compound, the ions are held together by an attraction that we call the ionic bond. They are held together by an ionic bond. And the ionic bond is just simply an attraction between the cation, which is positively charged, and the anion, which is negatively charged. The ionic bond, this attraction, is really similar to the attractive force that you feel um, between two, magnetic, uh, two, two magnets or two magnetic substances. So it's just this attraction between the opposite forces, between the positive and negative charge. Ionic compounds are often formed at the exact same time as the ions themselves are being formed. So let's consider, for example, the sodium atom and the chlorine atom. And again, at this point, we're just talking about atoms, not ions. The sodium atom is in group 1a, which means it has one valence electron, and the chlorine atom is in group 7a, which means it has seven valence electrons. And here I'm using Lewis dot symbols to represent these atoms. If you're not familiar with Lewis dot symbols, you need to go back a video and, and um, get introduced to them so that this makes sense. Now, these, again, these are the atoms. Both of these elements, sodium and chlorine, they like to form ions. So in order for us to understand how they come together to form an ionic compound, we first need to think about how they will ionize. We've talked about ionization before. Specifically, I talked about how atoms like to gain or lose electrons to match the electron configuration of the noble gas that is closest to them on the periodic table. And that is definitely accurate. Um, a, a different way of thinking about that is that atoms like to gain or lose electrons so that they have a valence of eight. All of the elements, all of the noble gases, all the elements in, in group 8A, they all have eight valence electrons. So while we're thinking about what's going to happen with each of these atoms, our, our job here is to think about how they will gain or lose electrons in order to get to a valence of eight. For example, chlorine currently has a valence of seven, and it really wants to have a valence of eight. And the easiest way for it to do that is to just gain one more electron, which would give it eight. Sodium only has one electron, and again, it would really like to have a valence of eight. If sodium were to gain electrons to get to eight, sodium would actually have to gain a grand total of seven electrons, and that's a lot of electrons. Remember, every time you're picking up or dropping off electrons, there's energy involved in that process. Adding seven electrons to sodium is just not reasonable. So rather than add seven electrons to the sodium, sodium is instead just gonna get rid of its one electron. Now you might be saying that's not gonna get anybody to eight, but don't forget that there is underneath that valence, there's a full set of electrons. So what I've drawn here is like an energy level that's surrounded by an energy level. So if sodium can get rid of this one electron out here, it's gonna reveal a full entire valence set underneath it. Let me erase these, cause that's not a true Lewis dot symbol. So we're gonna go back to this notation. And again, these atoms are gonna do the, the easiest and fastest thing that they can do to get themselves to eight. So sodium wants to get rid of this one electron. Chlorine wants to pick up one electron. What a perfect partnership here. The sodium is gonna give its electron over to the chlorine 
And when it does that, and the sodium is going to lose one electron, which means it's going to end up with a positive charge because it's lost an electron. And the chlorine is going to gain an electron, which means it'll have a negative charge from that gained electron. And so these are now the ions that have been formed by this electron transfer. And those ions are going to stick themselves together because they're attracted to each other. And we'll notate that this is the ionic compound, the chemical formula, for the ionic compound that is created between sodium and chlorine. So we call this again, we call this notation the chemical formula. It's just listing not the charges, but the symbols of the ions that are combined together to make this ionic compound. So this is the chemical formula of the ionic compound that is formed between sodium and chlorine. Let's practice this again. So let's say, what if we had calcium this time? And calcium's in group 2A, so it has two valence electrons. And let's bring calcium around some fluorine atoms. So fluorine, like chlorine, is in 7A, so it's got seven valence electrons. What do these atoms want to do to get themselves up to eight? Uh, calcium has only two. It's really unreasonable to think about calcium adding six electrons. That's too many. So instead, calcium wants to get rid of its two electrons. Really, these elements, they're going to do whatever they need to do that involves transferring the least number of electrons. So it would rather get rid of two than try to pick up six. Again, we're looking for the exchange of the fewest number of electrons. So calcium wants to get rid of two. Fluorine, like chlorine, wants to pick up one. Calcium can give up one of its electrons to the fluorine, but not both. The fluorine doesn't have room. Nine is not, not an option here. But there's no rule that says that we can only mix one of any type of element. So um, we can bring a second fluorine in. That's totally allowed. And that second electron from calcium can go to fluorine number two. Calcium is going to lose two electrons, which is going to make it the Ca2 plus ion. And we have made two fluorine ions, which are F minus. Each one has picked up one electron, so it's F minus. The notation for, for this compound is CAF and then a subscript 2. And that subscript 2 tells us that we have two of the fluorines, or fluoride specifically fluoride ions. So let's just practice this some more with a few more examples. What if we have a, a potassium atom with a fluorine atom? Potassium is in group one, so it has one valence. Fluorine is 7A. We just, we just looked at fluorine, so we know what that one looks like. Potassium wants to get rid of one. Fluorine wants to pick up one. When this happens, potassium becomes K plus because it's lost one electron. Fluorine becomes F minus because it picked up an extra electron. Together, they make KF. Beautiful. Here's another example. Let's look at the uh, sodium atom and the oxygen atom. Sodium is in group one. Oxygen is in group 6A. So that means oxygen has six valence electrons. Sodium wants to get rid of one electron. Oxygen wants to pick up two electrons. So our sodium can give one of the electrons to oxygen. The second uh, electron needs to come from a second sodium atom. So we're going to bring in a second sodium atom so that oxygen can have its second electron. That is going to leave us with two sodium atoms. Each sodium atom has lost an electron, so it's Na+. And then we have our oxygen atom. The oxygen atom has gained two electrons, so it's 2 minus. And our notation for that is Na subscript 2 O. Because we have two sodiums, we've got this little 2 down here that tells us two sodiums. All right, let's look at another example. Magnesium and sulfur. Magnesium is in group 2A. Sulfur, like oxygen, is in group 6A. 
Magnesium wants to get rid of two electrons. Sulfur wants to pick up two electrons. So this is really perfect. Magnesium can give both of its electrons over to sulfur. We end up with a magnesium two plus because it's lost two electrons and sulfur two minus sulfide because it's gained two electrons. We have one magnesium and one sulfur in this partnership, MGS. And here is our last example, magnesium, which we just looked at, two valence electrons. Phosphorus is in group 5A. So this guy has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons. Magnesium, like we talked about, wants to get rid of two. Phosphorus, in order to get to eight, Phosphorus either strips all five or picks up three. We want to do the thing that involves the exchange of the smallest number of electrons, so that means phosphorus wants to pick up three. Magnesium can give two electrons to phosphorus, but it wants three. It wants this one more. So that means we have to bring another, a second magnesium in. So that second magnesium can give an electron to phosphorus. And now the phosphorus is happy, but we have a problem over here with a magnesium that has an electron that needs to go somewhere. But that's okay. We can just bring in another phosphorus. A phosphorus is a place to put these extra electrons. So we'll bring in another phosphorus, and that extra electron can go to the phosphorus. So now this magnesium is happy, but our new phosphorus is sad because it still wants two more electrons. And so you kind of get the idea. Sometimes we have to go back and forth a bit in order to make everybody happy. Two electrons from this third magnesium going to the phosphorus. And what did we end up with here? We ended up with one, two, three magnesiums. So we've got three magnesiums. Each one of them lost two electrons, so each one of them is a two plus. And we ended up with two phosphorus ions, phosphide ions. Each one of our phosphide ions gained three electrons, so that's a three minus charge. When these combine together, our notation that we would use is Mg3, because we have three magnesiums, P2, because we have two phosphorus. Now the last thing that I'm gonna do is show you a, a trick. Now that we've taken the time to go through all of these processes, I'm gonna show you a trick for predicting the formula for ionic compounds that's actually really, really fast. If you happen to know the charges of the ions, which um, I've shown you how to use the periodic table to quickly determine the charges, the charge on the cation is the number of anions that you need, and the charge on the anion is the number of cations that you need to make the ionic compound. So for example, the potassium's charge is plus one, which tells us that we only need one fluorine in our molecule, our compound, and the fluorine's charge is a minus one, which tells us that we only need one potassium. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Over here, the charge on the uh, sodium plus one, that's the number of oxygen that we need, just one. The charge on the oxygen is two minus. That two is the number of sodiums that we need. I call this the crisscross rule, where you just take the charge from one and it becomes the subscript of the other. Even for tricky ones like this, the charge on the magnesium becomes the number of phosphorus that we need and the charge on the phosphorus becomes the number of magnesiums that we need. So that makes this whole process really fast. The only way that this crisscross rule can sometimes get you into trouble would be a compound like magnesium sulfide. If we just use the crisscross rule blindly, the charge on the sulfur becomes the number of magnesium, so that means Mg2, and the charge on the magnesium becomes the number of sulfur, so that would be S2. And the thing with ionic compounds is that, kind of like fractions, we always just want to reduce them down to their um, lowest whole number ratio. So Mg2S2, we just simplify that down to MgS. Uh, and the same would be true if for some reason you came up with like uh, Na4O2, we would just want to simplify that down to Na2O, although you should never come up with an Na4O2, that doesn't make sense. But again, just the idea of simplifying it down to uh, a ratio 
the lowest, smallest whole numbers.